Hello everybody, my name is Giovanni Deligios. I'm a PhD student at ETH in Zurich and it's a pleasure for me today to be presenting joint work that was carried out with Martin Hirt and Chandel Liu Zhang while at ETH. The title of the work is Round Efficient Synchronous Byzantine Agreement and Multiparty Computation with Asynchronous Fallback. I'll begin by providing some motivation for our work and then I'll dive into some more detail into the main results. We deal with two prominent problems in distributed computing and cryptography, namely the problem of Byzantine agreement and the problem of multi-party computation. A quick reminder, in Byzantine agreement, a set of n parties, each holding an input vi in 0 or 1, want to agree on a common output in 0 or 1, despite the fact that a fraction of the parties might be corrupted by an adversary and actively misbehaving and deviating from the protocol. In multi-party computation, which is a more general problem which includes Byzantine agreement as a special case, a set of n parties, each holding an input in 0 or 1, want to compute a common function of their inputs without revealing anything about their inputs that could not be inferred by looking directly at the output of the computation. When designing protocols to solve these problems, one needs to make assumptions about the network infrastructure that is available to the parties performing these protocols. And typically, in the literature, two of the most prominent models that are considered are the synchronous model, in which parties are assumed to have synchronized clocks, and furthermore, it's assumed that each message sent by a party is delivered within a certain known delay delta, which is known to all parties and can be used in the design of protocols. Or another prominent model that is also assumed is the asynchronous model, in which both of these assumptions are dropped and we assume that the adversary has the power of arbitrarily delivering the messages that are sent by honest parties and parties do not have access to synchronized clocks. And the only assumption that we keep in this case is that all messages sent by honest parties are eventually delivered by the adversary. It is not uncommon in both of these scenarios to assume that parties have access to authenticated channels and we're going to keep this assumption as well. The security guarantees that can be achieved in these two different models are different and in the synchronous models both BA and MPC protocols can be achieved which are secure up to n halves corruptions. But the problem is that as soon as the synchrony assumptions on the network are violated then all security guarantees tend to be lost pretty quickly. And in the asynchronous model, on the other hand, the protocols that are designed are robust even in unpredictable networks, but on the other hand, the security guarantees that can be achieved are significantly weaker. For example, BA and MPC protocols can only be achieved up to and third corruptions. So when deploying protocols in real life networks, which can be typically fast, but experience occasional congestures or failures or delays, then one is faced with a dilemma or whether Modeling this network as a synchronous network and deploying protocols that are designed in the synchronous model, therefore risking catastrophic security failures when the network experiences delays, or whether to model this network as an asynchronous network and deploy the more robust protocols that are designed in the asynchronous model and then do not exploit uh, the extra security guarantees that one could achieve by the fact that the network is usually fast. So it's quite natural to ask the question of whether one could be able to design BA and MPC protocols that are secure for the maximum threshold corruptions in both the synchronous model and the asynchronous model. A recent line of work, starting in 2019 with the work of Bloom, Katz and Loss, and that was carried on in 2020 by the work of Bloom, Liu Zhang and Loss, answered both of these questions affirmatively under some proven to be optimal threshold assumption, and that is that the number of corruptions when the network is asynchronous plus two times the number of corruptions when the network is synchronous must be smaller than n, and that the number of corruptions when the network is asynchronous must be smaller or equal than the number of corruption when the network is synchronous. When the network is asynchronous, we refer to around as a time interval of length delta, and since parties have access to synchronized clocks, then they also have agreement on the current round they are currently in. Round complexity, that is the number of rounds required by a protocol to terminate, is often used as a measure of efficiency of protocols, and our goal in this project 
is to improve on the round efficiency of known BA and MPC protocols known in the hybrid realm. So super quick, I would like to give an overview of where the room for improvement in these protocols is. Let's start talking about Byzantine agreement protocols. So purely synchronous Byzantine protocols achieving constant rounds are divided into two main categories. There are Monte Carlo type protocols, which run in a fixed number of rounds and achieve security up to a small error probability. So this style of protocol as a round complexity, which is constant in a security parameter. And then there's Las Vegas type protocols. And these are protocols that whenever they terminate, they achieve security, but they only terminate with probability one. And in this case, they run with an expected constant number of rounds. On the contrast, protocols for BA that function in this hybrid realm that we've introduced, they have a round complexity which is linear in the number of parties participating in the protocol. So this is one of the places where there's room for improvement. And now if we have a look at MPC protocols, whose round complexity is typically calculated in terms of all-to-all -all broadcast rounds in the literature, purely synchronous MPC protocols typically require a constant number of all-to-all -all broadcast rounds, while the known MPC protocols in the hybrid realm require a number of broadcast rounds that is linear in the depth, multiplicative depth of the circuit to evaluate. So this is the second place where there is room for improvement. And in both cases, we provide positive results, meaning that we show the first known BA protocol, which is secure when run over a synchronous network and is also secure when run over an asynchronous network. And that requires a constant number of rounds when the network is asynchronous. And we provide both flavor of these BA protocols, that is a version with probabilistic termination and a version uh, running in a fixed number of rounds. And for MPC, we provided the first known MPC protocol, uh, which is secure when run over a synchronous network and remains secure when run over an asynchronous network. And at the same time, as a number of all-to-all -all broadcast rounds, which does not depend uh, on the depth of the circuit to evaluate. I will now dive into a little bit more depth in our constructions for Byzantine agreement protocols. But before I do that, I think it's useful if we briefly recall the main properties that are desirable from a Byzantine agreement protocol. As you recall, a Byzantine agreement protocol is run between n parties, of which each party holds an input in 0, 1, and each party produces an output upon terminating the protocol. And that output is going to be either a bit 0, 1, and we allow for an extra symbol called top that is going to have the function of basically signaling when parties detect then the network they are running the protocol in is indeed asynchronous. Typically, there are two main properties we require, the validity property and the consistency property. The validity property guarantees that if parties, honest parties at least, have pre-agreement on a certain bit before executing a BA protocol, then they're going to preserve this agreement and they're all going to output this bit at the end of the protocol. While the consistency property guarantees that even if parties are not in agreement before executing a protocol, they will be upon terminating the protocol. So it guarantees that each honest party outputs the same bit. And in our case, also, we, we allow for parties to all output the same top symbol. Since we're going to allow in our protocols for this unusual output behavior, we introduce the liveness property, which guarantees that under certain conditions, parties do not output this extra symbol top. And that is, they really output a bit in 0, 1. And we're going to see that we require protocols to have this liveness property only when the network is synchronous. So that when the network is synchronous, in the, in the BA protocols achieve the same guarantees that are usually achieved by synchronous protocols in the literature. Another kind of uh, validity property that we can require from BA protocols is a weak validity. And that means that if parties do have agreement on a bit before executing a protocol, then they either output this bit or they output this top symbol. And we're going to see that we require this weaker form of validity from protocols when the network is asynchronous. To achieve a BA protocol that is secure up to TS corruption when the network is asynchronous and that is also secure up to TA corruption when the network is asynchronous, and I recall that by secure we mean that it achieves the validity and consistency guarantees. The main idea is to run two BA protocols in succession, and this idea is due to Bloom, Katz and Loss, and it was first published in 2019. 
And from the synchronous BA protocol, we require security when the network is synchronous up to TS corruptions. And from the asynchronous protocol, we require security when the network is asynchronous up to TA corruptions. But also from these two protocols, we require some extra security guarantees that protocols would not typically achieve. And that is that from the synchronous protocol, we require that when the network is asynchronous, it also achieves this form of weak validity that we discussed before. And from the asynchronous protocol, we require that when the network is synchronous, it achieves validity and termination up to TS corruptions. And please recall that TS is generally larger than TA. So this, this is not a trivial property to achieve for an asynchronous protocol. If indeed we have protocols with these extra properties, then we can do a quick analysis to show that indeed this construction actually achieves security. So if parties do have pre-agreement on a bit and the network is synchronous, then this pre-agreement is going to be maintained. So the parties will all output a bit and then we'll run the asynchronous protocol again with pre-agreement and thanks to the validity plus termination property, they're going to output the same bit. On the other hand, if the network is synchronous and parties do not have agreement on a bit, then they will have agreement on a bit by the end of the synchronous protocol because uh, this protocol is secure. And then this agreement is going to be preserved by the asynchronous protocol and its validity property. When the network is asynchronous, on the other hand, basically all the security guarantees fall on the asynchronous protocol. And the only thing that the synchronous protocol guarantees is that indeed, if parties do have pre-agreement on a bit, then this agreement is not broken by running the synchronous protocol because this protocol achieves weak validity in an asynchronous network. That means that if parties output the symbol top from this protocol, then they're going to go back and use their previous input VI as input to the second asynchronous protocol. So they're still going to have pre-agreement upon entering the asynchronous protocol. And then the security of the asynchronous protocol is going to guarantee that indeed uh, security is achieved for the whole construction. And now that we have introduced this high level idea, we're going to observe that in the original construction by Bloom, Katz and Loss, these two BA protocols with extra properties were actually instantiated through some construction. And the synchronous one in particular was achieved by a slight modification of the original Dolev strong protocol, which requires a linear number of rounds in the number of parties participating in the protocol. Um, on the other hand, the asynchronous protocol that they use already achieves a constant number of rounds when the network is synchronous. So the focus of our work is going to be of actually providing a construction for the synchronous portion of this compiler that runs in constant rounds. And we're going to have to show a BA protocol that is securing a synchronous networks up to TS corruptions, and that achieves TA weak validity also when the network is asynchronous. So this is what I'm going to do next. But to discuss our construction, I first have to introduce a different type of agreement primitive, uh, which is sometimes known in the literature as Crusader's agreement. But that has mostly been called lately weak consensus. And weak consensus primitives, they are very similar to Byzantine agreement primitives, but they have a relaxed consistency property. So instead of asking for all honest parties to output the same, the same output at the end of the protocol, we're going to relax this property and we're only going to require that parties do not output contradicting bits at the end of the protocol. Now, if the output uh, set was only 0 and 1, this would be the same as asking the traditional consistency property. But if we enlarge the output set to include other values, and in particular we allow the top value from before and now also a new value, bottom, then this property is strictly weaker than requiring normal consistency. I now introduce our construction, which is an adaptation of an idea originally due to Feldman and Michali in the purely synchronous setting. The idea is the following. Parties run, in succession, many iterations. Each iteration consists of an execution of a weak consensus protocol followed by a common coin toss invocation. A common coin toss is simply a functionality that outputs a uniformly common random bit 
and that uh, can only invoke if at least one honest party wishes to do so. These kind of functionalities can easily be implemented through distributed protocols, but in our paper we assume an ideal functionality with these properties. In the purely synchronous setting, the idea behind this construction is that if parties output a bit from the weak consensus protocol, then they keep this bit as output of the whole iteration. On the other hand, if parties output the bottom symbol as output of the weak consensus protocol, then they're going to take the common coin value as output of the whole iteration instead. Now, since weak consensus preserves pre-agreement, if parties do have pre-agreement on a common bit, then this, this pre-agreement is never going to be broken because they will just ignore the value of the common coin. On the other hand, if parties do not have pre-agreement on a bit, then in each iteration they will reach agreement with probability at least one half, that is, the probability that the common coin value matches the output of the parties that did output a bit from the weak consensus protocol. And remember that parties never output contradicting bits from a weak consensus protocol, so all parties output the same bit or the bottom symbol. So the problem is that when trying to transport this construction in the setting where you don't know what the network conditions are before executing the protocol, you have no way of knowing whether if you don't receive a message, you didn't receive this message because the network is asynchronous and the adversary drops this message, or if the network is asynchronous and simply the party sending the message was corrupted and he never sent the message in the first place. So the way we circumvent this problem is as follows. Instead of just allowing parties to have one abort behavior in the weak consensus protocol, that is by outputting the bottom symbol, we allow honest parties to have two different um, abort behaviors in the weak consensus protocol, that is either output a bottom symbol or outputting a top symbol. And the difference is that we're able to, through some kind of detection in the protocol, to make sure that when the network is synchronous, parties never output the top symbol, and when the network is asynchronous, parties never output the bottom symbol. So now the way we can recover the previous construction is as follows. When parties output the bottom symbol, they will take as output of the whole iteration simply the value of the common coin. And when the parties output the top symbol, they will simply take their original input as output of the whole iteration. Now remember that when the network is asynchronous, we only care for weak validity. So this makes sure that if parties have pre-agreement, they will all output either the three agreed upon bit or the top symbol. And in, in either case, they will take their original input as output of the iteration and preserve the pre-agreement through successive iterations. So next I'm going to present our construction, one of our constructions for such a weak consensus protocol, try to go into some details and also argue informally about the security of such a protocol. But I hope that the way this protocol fits into the bigger picture is now clear. The protocol is actually quite short and simple. In this we assume that parties have access to a public key infrastructure which allows them to sign messages but most importantly allows to forward cryptographic evidence that a certain message was received by another party in a previous round. One of the big challenges in designing these protocols is that if the network condition is not known when parties begin the protocol then if a message is not received that was supposed to be received by a party, this party has no way to know whether the message was dropped by the adversary, because the network is asynchronous, for example, or if the party sending the message is corrupted by the adversary and did not send the message in the first place. So the high-level idea of how to deal with this is to carefully consider the thresholds of messages that a party needs to receive in order to decide that the network is asynchronous. In this protocol, at the beginning, each party signs their bit using their private key and send this signed bit to all other parties. And then the parties collect the messages they receive and divide them into two sets. The messages that were received with bit 1 and the messages that were received with bit 0. So the first thing parties do is to look at the total number of messages they received. And if the total number of messages they received is below a cutoff, which is set to n minus ts, and remember ta and ts in this case are parameters for the protocol, then they simply set their intended output to top and they don't do any of the following steps. If instead they received enough messages, that is at least n minus ts, then they check if they received a bit enough times, and enough times we mean at least n minus ts minus ta times. 
If this is the case, they set their intended output to this bit and they collect all the signatures they received on this bit and they send uh, the set of signatures to all other parties. Then, if they receive no collection of signatures on the opposite bit of the one they receive, they simply output the bit they decided, and otherwise, if they do receive a collection of signature on the opposite bit to the one they decided, then they set their intended output to the bottom symbol and they output the bottom symbol. So, why does this construction work? When we argue about the security of protocols that are run alternatively in synchronous and asynchronous networks, we always need to consider both cases separately, decide which properties we require from our protocols in the synchronous case and in the asynchronous case, and then indeed prove that if this assumption holds, then the desired properties are achieved. When we argue in asynchronous networks, we're going to assume that at most TA parties are corrupted in execution of the protocol. And when we argue in synchronous networks, we're going to assume that at most TS parties are corrupted in an execution of the protocol. And we're also going to keep the assumption that I'm going to discuss later that TA plus 2TS is smaller than N and that TA is smaller or equal than TS. And under these assumptions, now I'm going to argue about the security of the protocol. Let's start by considering the synchronous case. So let's first assume the network is asynchronous. The properties we want to prove is validity of this protocol and weak consistency of this protocol. And also we require that when the network is asynchronous, parties do not output the symbol top. So let's first check that when the network is asynchronous, parties do not output the symbol top. If the network is asynchronous, then in step two, each party is going to send a validly signed message which means that in step three, um, the amount of messages each party receives, it's going to be at least n minus ts, which means that parties are going to set the intended output to bottom. And since there is no other part in the protocol after these where parties might set their input to top, then this property holds. Let's check now that if parties have pre-agreement on a certain bit and the network is asynchronous, then indeed they will output this bit. So if parties have pre-agreement, let's say on bit 1, without loss of generality, then in step 2, each party is going to send a validly signed bit 1 to other parties, which means that in step 3, not only will parties receive enough values 1, that is n minus ts, but they will also receive enough values so that they set their intended output to 1, because n minus ts is greater or equal than n minus ts minus ta. And please notice that there is no way that corrupted parties can generate enough signatures on the opposite bit to convince honest parties to output the symbol bottom in step 4, because this would mean that TS is actually greater or equal than N minus TS minus TA, and the assumption we have on our thresholds actually guarantee that this is not true. So indeed, when the network is asynchronous, validity holds up to TS corruptions, Let's now check that when the network is asynchronous and at most TS parties are corrupted, then the weak consistency property holds. Remember that weak consistency means that if a certain party outputs a bit, then no party will output the opposite bit. This property holds because let's assume a party outputs one without loss of generality. This means that they received at least n minus TS messages minus TA with uh, bit one in step three which means they collect the signatures on these messages and they send them to all other parties in the following step. So even if a party had decided on the opposite bit in step three, then in step four, they're gonna set their output to bottom because indeed these are valid signatures on bit one and this guarantees that no honest parties output contradicting bits. This concludes the security when the network is asynchronous. Now, when the network is asynchronous, we still care about the weak validity property and let's assume the network is asynchronous, that at most TA parties are corrupted in an execution of this protocol, then we can easily check that if all parties have pre-agreement on a certain bit, then they're gonna set their output to top, and the only way they set their output to uh, something other than top, if it's in step three, they, re they receive at least N minus TS messages since of these messages at least n minus ts minus ta are going to come from honest parties since there are only ta corrupted parties then if indeed they do set their output to something other than bottom then they're going to set this output to the to the agreed upon bit and also these honest parties do not have the power to generate uh, 
enough signatures on the opposite bit to convince honest parties in step four to output the bottom symbol, because this would mean then TA is greater or equal than N minus TS minus TA, and this is false thanks to the assumptions we made on the thresholds. Plugging this construction for weak consensus into the high-level construction we described before, this already yields a BA protocol which is secure both in synchronous and asynchronous networks and that can run alternatively in fixed rounds or in expected constant rounds. Even though I'm not gonna go into detail of any other construction we provide in the paper, we did investigate some other problems. For example, we investigated the optimality of the threshold assumptions we've just described when instead of asking full security in both synchronous and asynchronous networks, for example, we weaken the validity guarantees we require in asynchronous networks. And indeed, we prove that in this case, these threshold assumptions are too strong and that one can actually achieve protocols with weaker threshold assumptions. And this is interesting because sometimes these protocols with only weak validity can be used in bigger constructions, such as, for example, MPC or uh, protocols that try to achieve different security guarantees in both synchronous and asynchronous networks. We also provided some insight into the equivalence of the broadcast uh, problem and the Byzantine agreement protocol, which indeed holds when the networks are synchronous and which is known not to hold when the networks are asynchronous. And we show how to achieve respectively Byzantine and broadcast protocols with these weak validity guarantees in asynchronous networks from one another thus solving this equivalence problem. To finish, we also worked in the MPC setting, where we improved on, on previous results by providing the first MPC protocol, which is secure both in synchronous and asynchronous networks, and that only requires a number of broadcast rounds, all-to-all -all broadcast rounds, which is independent of the multiplicative depth of the circuit to evaluate. To achieve this, we used previous known results due to Bloom, Liu, Zhang and Loss, and also some known results about garbling circuits in the multi-party setting. And indeed, if we implement the broadcast channels in this protocol using our construction for broadcast, which is secure in both synchronous and asynchronous networks, then these broadcast channels can be implemented in such a way that the number of rounds required is constant in the number of parties participating in the protocol. So this is it for this presentation. Thank you for listening so far. It was a pleasure for me to be able to present this work here at TCC and please refer to the full version of these papers for all details and feel free to email me about questions and discussions about this work. Thank you very much.